Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BioBus Student Town Hall Live. My name is Ashley, and I am a BioBus scientist. Today is our final Student Town Hall of 2020. Our topic is art and science, and we have a really exciting show for you all, full of student art, amazing guest experts, intern alumna, and even a state senator. So before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about BioBus. So BioBus is an education nonprofit building a scientific community for everyone by bringing scientists and students together to discover, explore, and pursue science. We are based in New York City, where we operate two mobile laboratories. These are the BioBuses filled with microscopes which you may have seen or even been on before. If you have been on the bio bus, let us know in the chat. We also have our community laboratory, the BioBase, which is in Harlem. Come do some science with us when the space is open again. Stay till the end to learn more about our different programs and to hear from State Senator Jose Serrano. We are very excited that the topic today is art and science. So let's take a second to check out the mystery science image again. Did you make a prediction about what it is? So this is actually some art that was made by our special guest, Frank. And this art is made of fungi. And so what we're seeing on this tile is fungal mycelium. So when you think of fungi, you might think about mushrooms and that's like a body part of the fungus, but they have other body parts too. Most of the fungus, most of the fungus body is the mycelium, um, which looks like little strands that are called hyphae. This body part is used to take in nutrients for the fungus. And there's actually some research that shows that plants use mycelium to send nutrients to one another too. So since we're talking about his work, why don't I introduce you to our two wonderful guests who are here to answer your questions. So let's first start with Dr. Annabel Romero Hernandez, who is a structural biologist at Regeneron and an illustrator. Welcome, Annabel. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Annabel Romero. And as Ashley mentioned, my job is actually to look at proteins and see how they interact with each other so we can design new drugs to fight, uh, for example, COVID-19. So that's what I do on my daily job. You can see one of my structures that looks like all these party ribbons in this slide. And also um, on my free time, I like to illustrate uh, topics that are science related. Thanks so much, Annabelle. And our second guest expert today is Frank Melendez, who is a professor of architecture and an architect. Frank, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Frank Melendez, and I'm an architectural educator and designer. And my partner, um, Nancy Denise, and I have a practice called Biomatters and Augmented Architectures. And in that practice, we explore different types of ways that we can think about making with new materials and living materials and living systems. So a lot of our work is based on understanding these living systems and, and new approaches to how we make and design things. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you both for being here. Um, so in addition to our two guests, we also have BioBus junior scientist alumna Alex here in the chat who will be collecting your questions. So ask anything you want to know in the chat. Alex, can you introduce yourself and tell us something that you're curious to learn today? Hi everyone, my name is Alex. Um, I interned for BioBus a couple summers ago. I'm currently a senior at University of Rochester um, and I have an interest in art and science and I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and as you can see, uh, I actually entered an art of science competition through my university and I won with this image, which I took 
as an intern at BioBus using a polarizing lens microscope. Um, it's actually urea, which is part of urine, um, but it looks super pretty, so you would never really think that. Um, I'm super excited to learn about how both our scientists today integrate art and science in their work, and I'm super excited to see the biomatter stuff. Um, I've recently gotten really into like environmentally friendly practices, so reusing waste for art sounds like a really cool thing. Totally, Alex. Yeah, I'm excited to learn about that too. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for reminding us about your beautiful picture of Urea. <laughs> so you all submitted some amazing questions ahead of time that I'll be asking to our guest scientists. But remember, we'll also be taking questions from the chat. So if you're curious about something, put it in the chat so that we can ask your questions to the scientists. Remember to tell us your name, age, and school if you can too. So here are the rules for my guest scientists. Scientists, you have two minutes to answer each question. If you're running out of time, my co-host Goldie the Dino is gonna signal to you that your time is up and you gotta wrap it up, all right? Okay, let's do this. All right, my first question comes from Charlize who is 11. And this question is for both of our guests. How do you use art? And what does it mean to you? So why don't we start with Frank? That's a good question. Um, thanks for the question. So I use art as a tool for inspiration and how I, how I create. And so for me, it means um, how I see and observe the world um, and how I experience the world. It also means being creative. So um, it in art inspires me to make and express my, my views of the world. And it's really more of a lifestyle. It's a, it's a passion and a way of, of working. And for me, it's, it's working and playing that are combined together. That's really awesome. Annabelle, how would you answer this question? Uh, yeah, I think just like Fran said, it's a really interesting question and I'm just gonna quickly share my screen uh, to describe some of it. Um, here we have, um, for me, sort of like, why do I do art? This is actually an image of uh, what you see is the shape of a DNA because I'm, I'm really, I'm, first of all, I'm a scientist. So that's what uh, drives me the most. And this all list, it's all the plants that have their uh, genome sequence. So normally when you look at this, you go to a website and you just see tons of information. So the way I like to use art is to make, to visualize everything, all the information in a simple, simple way. So everybody can understand it. And then it's also pleasant to see. So um, I like what Frank mentioned. I think also it's a lifestyle. So that's something uh, that uh, I like, I share and I feel like it helps me to communicate with everybody. Awesome. Annabelle, you used the word genome. Can you remind me what that means? Yes. Uh, in a simple uh, uh, sentence, it's actually all the information that uh, it's encoded in every single one of your cells to determine how, uh, how you are, even things of like how tall you are, uh, the color of your hair, etc. And it also, it's the same for plants. It tells us if it's gonna be a papaya or a pineapple, for example. Cool, so the code of our DNA. Awesome, thank you both. Okay, so Jaden, who is eight, is wondering, are art and science similar? Annabelle, can you tell us, is there, since you're an artist and a scientist, is there anything that they have in common? Yes, and I can share another one of my slides. Um, so you can get to see here, you actually see um, the left, it's a painting I did on watercolor or what it represents again, the DNA and uh, using some piece um, that were uh, related to Gregory Mendel, who was well known for determining the genetics that will tell like, for example, if you're gonna have uh, brown eyes or blue eyes, depending on your family, the same thing, it's for peace. Even if they are, uh, the flowers are 
pink or they are purple. And for me, it, I use this image to relate how science and art are the same because you see me here painting, right? So just the same way I plan every day an experiment is the same way I will plant uh, whenever I paint. So they are, you have to be very dedicated for both and you have to have, a, I will even call it a scientific method even for when you're painting. What do you want to communicate? What do you want to say? So I feel that they are really similar in the way you can work with them. That is very beautiful. I love it. Um, I have a question here from Parker, who is nine. This question is also for Annabelle. Why did you want to be a scientist and an artist? Uh, <clears throat> that's a great question. I've uh, I started first as a scientist and here I'm sharing another one of my paintings. And this is actually a painting of one of the proteins that I studied during my PhD. Um, this protein, it's important for functions in the brain, but what's relevant for me, it's not only its function, but we can understand its function by the way uh, it's shaped. And here uh, I'm showing again, this looks like a party with all these ribbons, but it actually tells you how it's gonna be moving and interacting. So I decided to be a scientist to go deep into the shape of the proteins to understand how things work as we can see normally. And I feel that uh, solving structures like this, it's actually a piece of, uh, of art. So it's a good intersection of um, how uh, my work as a scientist started merging into art. And that's why later, because of uh, studying these proteins, I decided to actually jump in to do uh, some more art because I wasn't good at painting uh, when I was a kid. So I always said, even if you feel you're not good at it, just keep trying, keep drawing every day and you'll get better. Thank you for that inspiration. I needed to hear that because I am not good at art, but I still try. Also, those, those really pretty colors and the ribbons make me want to learn a lot more about your science, which is really cool. That's a, a fun effect that art can have too. Um, my next question comes from Christine, and this is for Frank. Frank, what is the coolest thing you have ever built? That's a good question as well. Um, and I think, it's also a difficult question. I, I like making things and we, I've always made things in different ways, making things with my hands, also using the computer to, to make things. Um, and more recently, we've been um, looking at how we can make things using waste materials. So I'll share my screen really quickly just to show some of the, um, some of the work that we've been doing with making using uh, 3D, 3D printers. So um, we've been looking at different types of, of waste, like eggshells, for example, and looking at how we can begin to use this material in upcycle waste or coffee grounds and other agricultural waste and begin to use that to make a material that is um, that we're able to use to 3D print. So currently what we're interested in is, is um, making this and we think it's pretty cool that we're able to generate uh, forms and geometries uh, using the computer and using machines that are difficult to make by hand and other traditional methods. Um, Frank, you mentioned a 3D printer. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and why people use it? Yeah, so a 3D printer, and I could share my screen again here, um, is a machine that is controlled by the computer and it runs on an axis. And so when you feed this information into the machine, we can begin to use it to build up materials one layer at a time. So it's an additive process where we create um, objects by printing them one layer at a time. That is super cool and a really cool video too. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so if you are just joining our BioBus Student Town Hall, my name is Ashley and I'm here with scientists and um, architect. Um, 
Annabelle and Frank. We are here taking your questions about art and science. So why don't we take some questions from the chat? Do we have anything yet, Alex? We don't have any. Um, we don't have any chat questions right now. We had one, but it was similar to something Annabelle answered earlier. So. Okay. So make sure you send in those questions. Maybe I can I can show you some cool stuff to get your your questions flowing, um, because I spent this fall with a group of amazing young scientists working on some art and science projects, using art as a way to kind of describe our natural surroundings. Um, and this photo here is is. A photo of some of the students in our Sunday science class. So throughout this town hall, I'm actually going to show you some of their work because I'm very proud of it. And I think they did an amazing job um, demonstrating how you can use art to understand science. Um, so the first thing I'm going to show you is um, these field guides that were made by some of our young scientists. And our first one comes from Kaya. Um, Danny, do you want to press play? Hi, everyone. I'm Kaya, and I'm going to share with you my field guide about a blue jay. So I drew a picture of a blue jay, and then I wrote down some things about it. So I wrote down, I wrote down the scientific name, the habitat, the, their length, their wingspan, what they eat, and some fun facts. And I thought it might be fun if I shared the fun facts with you. All right, so blue jays often don't migrate south. They make the sound J, 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 but sometimes imitate the screeching of a red-shouldered hawk. And when a blue jay feels threatened or aggressive, their crest is held up, and their crest is the little part on their head right here. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed. Bye. Okay, so maybe our, our experts can tell me a little bit. What do you think about Kaya's work? I thought it was really pretty. Uh, it reminded me of the bird journal that we did previously for Biobus, which I actually can share. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it here. Uh, it was something similar and I'm glad that it can be used as inspiration for everybody because uh, I think it's a great tool to be a scientist. Danny, can we show one more field guide? It's the, just the next slide. Um, another student did a, a different organism for her field guide. The organism I chose is a tree, and I know that's kind of weird since we've probably all probably seen a tree before, but this one's kind of weird. It, um, it's never really grown, even though trees don't grow that much, it's just like, it's always stayed the exact same, except the leaves. And speaking of leaves, it always has the most colorful leaves throughout the seasons, no matter which one it is, and even if it's like really windy or it's like snowing or just like any type of storm it never loses any branches even though it's like super fragile and like weak which makes no sense to me and i know that a tree in english is a tree and in spanish a tree is an edible <laughs> thanks charlize okay frank what did you think about her work i think that's uh amazing observation. I also really love the Blue Jay drawing. It was a very beautiful drawing and I love the colors of it. In terms of the tree, I think it's interesting that, you know, we think about nature and our, our um, how, how we relate to nature and ways of thinking about designing um, and using science to develop this relationship with nature. And I like the, um, just the, the thought of thinking about wood and it made, it, between the blue jay and, and the tree, it made me think about other animals that make things or that make homes uh, like birds that make nests and beavers that make dams. And so um, it's nice that 
to see these drawings and these observations of, of natural systems and animals and plants. Totally, we can learn so much from that and how to build things that nature has already kind of figured out. <laughs> True. Um, all right, why don't we go back to some of our submitted questions and I'll wait for you all in the chat to give us some more, some more ideas of things to talk about. What do you wanna learn? Let us know. Okay, so this question comes from Hector, who is 12. And this question is for Frank. How or why do you use living things for art? Yeah, so kind of picking up on what I was mentioning right now, I think we can learn a lot from nature and we can learn a lot from living, living uh, things. Um, and so it, for us, it's about a, a better understanding of um, how we can begin to relate to our environment by learning from non-human uh, animals. And so, yeah, we're very inspired by, by nature. I'm very inspired by looking at natural forms, um, how things grow, how, what they, what they, uh, the shapes that they grow into or the forms that they grow into and looking at geometry. So there's a lot of, of relationship, not, not only to, to science, in addition to science, but, but math and looking at some of the geometric patterns in nature. Um, so yeah, looking at other animals and, and if we think a, a, another example of a spider and spider webs and the, the, the patterns and formations that spiders uh, um, create um, to create a, a structure that's used to live in, but also uh, that has a performance. It's, it's, it helps the spider to capture food. So for, I, I think that's really important for me in terms of how um, I think about architecture is that it's shelter for us, but it also has, a, and um, there's a certain performance that it serves to keep us warm and, or cool or um, comfortable within a, a space. Oh, that's super cool, thank you. Um, and I have another question for Frank. This one is from Charlize, who we just heard from actually. So Frank, if you use natural materials for art, does it matter what you use? And if you use the wrong thing, does that affect your art? Yeah, this is a good question. And I would say yes, that it does, it does make a, a difference. And in, in fact, the name of, our, uh, the name of my uh, company, Biomatters, is based on this. This it has it has two meanings that um, biology or life matters, and it's important. But also, um, biological material and thinking about materials, um, and how we how we make art and architecture. Um, so yeah, uh, the material is a very important uh, decision in the design process, and so um, for example, right now with the, the mystery image of mycelium, that material is, is a living material um, and it's similar to a glue. It begins to bind things together as it grows. Uh, so we, we think of it as a, as a natural glue, which is also better for our, our planet if we start to think about how materials, um, how we can begin to use materials that are recycled or that are not hazardous to our planet. Um, and so that's something that's very important for us is, is um, thinking about materials and it's really how we really start to begin to think about our, our designs. Awesome, Frank, thank you. Um, my next question is for Annabelle. So, and this comes from Jacques who is 10. Um, Annabelle, when you're painting, does everything have to be perfect? Yeah, that's a question that even sometimes I still make myself. And is, do I like it? Is this done? And I think it's something really important um, whenever we're uh, making any drawing or painting or anything uh, that we think it's art artistic is that uh, I think we should enjoy the process of doing it. 
rather than thinking, is it finished? Is it done? Because it's never going to be fully done. And we're always going to see those little mistakes, but nobody else is going to see them. So just be uh, confident and be, I feel happy with what I have. And even if I could add more, it doesn't matter because um, even those little details that I know, oh, I made a mistake and I had to use a different color. Nobody can tell. So yeah. that's something that um, when I was starting to paint, it was uh, really um, worrisome for me to say, oh, if I'm no good or if I didn't finish. So I always said, enjoy the process. And then everything else will just flow and you will just all of a sudden will feel happy with what you made. Also, uh, resting your eyes, like stop at what you're uh, every in your drawing or painting or whatever you're doing. Take a look uh, at the next day with fresh eyes and you're going to be much more happier with the result. Um, Annabelle, but you make a lot of like sciencey art. So do you have to make sure that everything is like scientifically correct? That's actually a good question. And there's many uh, actual um, medical and scientific illustrators that their job is to make sure that every single drawing, it's uh, really accurate. For, for example, if you ever uh, go through the, you can go to the website or if you happen to buy the National Geographic magazine, it's a great example of scientific illustration where everything has to be perfect. Every little drawing that you see of a bird the number of uh, feathers that you see, it's accurate. Um, what I do, it's not as accurate. And actually I'm gonna share my screen um, to show you something um, that is not as accurate. And it's this example that you're seeing here right now. This is a project I did where um, I, I draw all uh, things that were science related, even going from like organs, like you see the lungs and the kidneys, to other things like a bacteriophage. And in reality, it is sort of the shape of the bacteriophage. It has a capsid, that it's this little uh, geometrical thing, that it's the head, and it has these legs that attach to infect bacteria. However, uh, they don't have these cute little eyes that we're looking at here. But my goal here is to, even if I get rid of some little details, um, that maybe doesn't make it scientific accurate, it's easy for you to remember. Next time you hear the word bacteriophage, it's going to be easier to remember that it's a virus that infects bacteria. And it has these cute little legs, and you're going to remember that a capsid it was this little head that had cute eyes. <laughs> that is very cute, and I will definitely remember that. <laughs> All right, my next question is also for Annabelle. This is from Alicia, who is eight. Um, she wants to know, what is paint made of? That's a very good question. And I mean, paint, uh, different paints, like there's watercolors, acrylics, oils, and they all have different textures. But overall, all paints come from pigment. And actually, pigment goes back to... Uh, ancient times where, I mean, now there's a lot of chemical compounds that uh, can produce color. But uh, back in the day where they didn't have this, they used to use minerals that come from uh, precious stones. One of them is called lapis lazuli, which is this blue stone. And actually, um, I'd had one watercolor uh, made out of this. Uh, it's, it's very rare, but it actually gives a nice uh, blue shine. So pigment is the um, basically the heart of every, um, of every uh, paint, either if it's watercolors or acrylics, then there's other solvents and binders. But um, in the end, pigments like that is um, the ones that made paint. Thank you so much. I actually have something to show you all. In our class, we explored a little bit about how we can see pigments. Um, and I will share that with you in a little bit. But first, I want to see if we have any chat questions. Alex, do we have any, any questions coming in? Yes, we do. So we have a couple questions here. The first two are from Kaya, who's 12. Uh, she was part, she presented her art earlier, her field guide. For Frank, her question is, how did you get into creating art with science? How would you describe your work? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I think for me, when I as I started to learn more about architecture and art, I, I started to realize that there was a in in many works of art and architecture, there's a strong connection to nature, um, and so. Um, so that inspired me to learn more about science. And as I started to learn more about science, like I mentioned, it's as, as humans, we, we have a, a certain amount of capacity to see the world. And so as I started to look at things under a microscope, I started to learn and discover other, other things that I couldn't see with my normal vision. So seeing, seeing, beginning to understand structures and forms and geometry under the microscope was something that was very inspirational for me. The other thing is just working with living systems and, and learning how those living systems relate to their environments. So just like us as humans, we, we relate to our environments. And I think we can learn a lot from looking at other natural systems um, and through a better scientific understanding of them, we can begin to apply some, some of those principles to the way that we relate to our environment as well. Thank you so much. Alex, do we have other questions? Yeah, so the second one, which is also from Kaya, is for Annabelle. Has your art helped you with your science? Do you think that art and science complement each other? Yeah, that is a question. Uh, this is a really good question. And uh, I love the Blue Jay, by the way. Um, because not only, it's, it's a common question that I've seen uh, people saying, uh, are art and science divided? And the answer is no. I feel that actually they are very uh, interconnected and the way that uh, art has helped me with um, my science or even my daily job is that when you wanna uh, draw a new thing or make a new painting, you have to uh, um, make really detailed observations, not necessarily because you're gonna end up drawing them, but because you have to understand kind of like if I want to draw a flower, I have to really look into it. And then by looking at that, I've been paying attention to details that I hadn't noticed. We just look um, uh, as a normal flower. We're like, OK, it has it's it's pink and the leaves are green. And that's that's about it. But then we start looking at the center. Oh, look, it has these little dots that are yellow, like orchids are really beautiful and it has to. Uh, and by doing this and by painting this, it has also to, uh, has taught me how to think and observe every time, even when I'm going to do an experiment, which I think it's a feature of a, every scientist to be, uh, make a lot of observations. And I think artists have to do a lot of observations. So I think they're hand in hand and they are more similar than uh, what you will think. That's really true. And Kaya, that was a beautiful question. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. I think we have one more, right? Yeah, we have one more. Uh, so a question, another question that came up, I don't know who it's from. It's from Cool Guy CG, but I don't know his name. Um, so it's another question for Annabelle. Uh, what kind of different mediums do you use to create your art in? Uh, so I actually, my main um, medium is watercolor. And that's how I started because um, I can do a lot of things, but there's many things. I started uh, playing a little bit with digital media, which if anybody has an iPad at home or something, there's also a nice way to try. Although I still like pencil or paper in the end. Uh, and then uh, I've been trying uh, other techniques as well. I've done acrylic and oil, but it's still, I always go back to watercolor. And I always say, if you want to start uh, painting and try to do observations, uh, just whatever you have in hand, it's always useful. You can even do collage. That's also doing art. Awesome. I, I have a, a question, actually. So normally I'm trying to break down science words, but now I think I need to break down an art word. <laughs> what is a, a medium when we're talking about art? Yeah, medium is uh, the way um, 
well, actually it's what describes, for example, watercolor. I use watercolors to paint. So when somebody asks me a medium is watercolor, or if I use the acrylics, that's the medium, or if I use the computer, that's the medium. Um, for Frank, actually nature is his medium, which I think is really cool. Frank, is that how you would describe it too? Sure, I would say that that's, that's one, of the, one of the mediums that I use. And, and I think, yeah, I think, um, there's many, right? Like I think what Annabelle's mentioning is she uses different types of mediums as well um, and, and has one in particular that she's interested in, which is watercolor. And I think I, I'm similar. I, I like to draw and sketch by hand. Um, I also like to uh, use the computer as a medium uh, to make things and, and to draw and create images. So um, yes, I have um, many, many mediums that I, I'm interested in, almost too many sometimes. It's hard to stay focused because I'm sure like many of you, you, you have a lot of interests in, in different things. Cool, so it's, it's like the thing that you use to make your art is the medium. Right. Cool, all right. Thank you so much. Um, we will definitely come back to the chat. So put some more questions in there if you have them. Um, and before we go back to the submitted questions, I actually have some more um, art from our students and our student showcase that I want to show you. First one is, um, oh, I think I put it in the wrong place. We'll go back to this. but. Um, so <laughs> the first one is um, in our Sunday science class, we made art with mushrooms, actually, kind of, kind of in Frank's territory here. So let's hear from Parker, who's going to tell us about his mushroom art. Hello, guys. This is Parker calling in from the news. And today I'm going to show you my spore print. So I haven't opened it yet. I did it on white paper and it turned out it was pretty brown. And it's brown spores. And this is a button mushroom. Thank you. Bye. Yes, amazing Parker. All right, it's let's <laughs> Hello guys. <laughs> let's jump to our next one. This is also a mushroom spore print from Foley. We got very creative in Flipgrid. <laughs> everybody and welcome back to channel 5 news i'm foley bondock and today i will show you my spore print here's my spore print and um i made my mom put hairspray on it so it will stay forever and it will not die so here's my spore print so there is a gap right there but that's fine all right everybody thanks for watching and have a good night Thank you, Danny. <laughs> and thank you, young scientists. If you want to um, actually do that experiment, um, there we have an explore at home challenge that I can share with you all so you can learn how to do that on your own. I will put it in the YouTube description below. Um, okay, let's get back to our submitted questions. Um, so this next question comes from Eric, who is 10 years old. This question is for Annabelle. My questions are, when, when was art created and why did we create science? Those are huge questions. So Annabelle, I'm going to let you take it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna barely touch on it because we could talk about this for hours. 
but um, I think uh, to describe when art was created, it was like, I think since like um, prehistoric times, like in the um, early um, caverns when they did those first paintings, everybody have seen those horses that are sort of like in red in those, in those caves. Um, those that could be considered the first uh, pieces of artwork. And then every civilization like uh, the Greeks, the Egyptians, they all had uh, different um, versions of art. So I think that uh, since the humans started, uh, discovered the fire and had some light, then I think art came along as well. And then to answer the other question of um, why did we create science? I think, I think science evolved naturally because people started getting curious and uh, about answering questions. And probably that was the way it was handled before. I mean, uh, back to the Greeks, they weren't even uh, describing themselves as scientists. It was more like a philosopher, right? That now we see that as a whole new thing, but actually they were the ones asking questions of why are things happening the way they are? And then we can jump onto like, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, for example, who, who was an artist that we know, everybody knows the Mona Lisa, but he also, uh, I will consider him a scientist. And even if the word wasn't fully developed, I think just having curiosity and try to develop observation um, started uh, what he will call like developing this new branch that later was called science. So I hope that helped a little bit to answer. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, my next question comes from Isabella, who is 12 years old. And this question is for both of you. When did you first get interested in the science and art field? Did you have any role models that inspired you or introduced you to the fields? Um, why don't we start with Frank first? Yeah, this is a, another good question. And I, I I started drawing when I was very young. I'm sure many of you, uh, that's that's something that a lot of us do when we're very young is we pick up pencils or crayons and begin to draw. And so for me, that that's how, that's something that I started doing at a young age and just, and, and continue to do. So um, as I started to uh, find other interests like um, math, for example, um, I had a lot of encouragement from my parents to uh, study architecture because that sort of bridges art and and math. And so I, they were very um, good role models for me and really inspired me to pursue my my passion and my interest in in drawing and thinking about architecture and how we how we design spaces. Awesome. Um, Annabelle, what about you? Um, well, I actually um, was introduced to uh, art a little later in my life, to be honest. I've been always interested in science and that's how um, that's how I started since I was a kid. I was always curious. And just like Frank said, I used to love to draw when I was a kid. Later, when I was in my teenager years, I started thinking maybe I'm not so good to draw. So I had to put it on the side for a little bit, but I continue working on science and um, that's what I did um, going to school. But then later I actually uh, decided to pick up a hobby just to have some fun on, uh, on the side. And then I started to decide to draw again. And um, I think just by feeling free and not feel like judge if anybody was gonna like it, I took art again. And, uh, and I think I've been integrating it now into, uh, into uh, science. And one fun fact, the first uh, sort of scientific uh, drawing that I did was a, uh, for a publication that I did about my thesis work. And um, that's how I started think merging more art and science because when I started drawing, I used to do only landscapes. So then um, it became a little, um, 
I mean, it's still, I still do it every now and then, but it became more fun to try to merge some of the science in there. So your first artwork got published right away? That's a yes. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Quite funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so let's take one more question from the chat. Alex, do we have a question? Yes, we do. So this question is from Ife, uh, who is 13.392 years old, and he's homeschooled. His question is, to both Frank and Annabelle, do you enjoy doing both art and science? Is it a lot of work? And then I'm wondering, is there one you like more? Do you like art or science more? If you do, I would be very curious to know. Um. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Frank, I'm going to call on you. Go All for right. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult question. If I have to, if I like one or or the other um, more, I think. Um, and also, um, just thinking about hard about the work, and I would say that that they're both very hard work and and it's it's because uh, for me I'm I'm passionate about what I do and so I think about it a lot and I put a lot of my time and energy um, into into what I'm what I'm drawing or what I'm making or what I'm what I'm observing as a natural system so yes it's 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 a lot of work but it's also a lot of fun I find it uh, something that um, is very enjoyable and I, I enjoy spending my time doing this. So it doesn't feel like work um, so much. And, um, and then in terms of um, uh, the second part of the question was, remind me. Yeah. Um, oh, one, you, one or the other, which one yeah, I enjoy Yeah, you had more. to choose one or the other. <laughs> so I think there's one that I know more about but um, and and so there's maybe maybe in terms of art and architecture, I'm more comfortable and familiar with that subject. But I don't necessarily see it as liking one or the other more. It's just a different type of relationship that I have with art and architecture versus my relationship with science. So one is more. Um, a gen, like a very a, a kind of investigation and studying and and trying to learn more about about science as I as I continue to build and develop my understanding of of art and architecture but right now at least and I'm very um, passionate about both of them thank you so much Frank Annabelle do you want to take a stab at that question yeah, I mean, um, I think in terms of if it's hard work, uh, I agree with Frank. I think both of them are hard work. And, uh, but I think it's like, just like Frank said, if you're having fun, um, and he said it like, if you're passionate, I think I always have fun, even if there's paintings that have been taking me over a month to complete. Um, uh, so it's like a lot of hours and then I sometimes I see no progress, but it's just fun of enjoying it. So even if it's hard work, you have fun. And same thing with science. Some of my experiments take months, uh, but in the end, it's that curiosity of getting to know what's going to happen. What am I going to see? Uh, those moments, nobody can take them away from me. So it doesn't matter how many hours I had to put on it. And um, which one I prefer? Uh, yeah, I think it's tough. Uh, I think I agree with Frank. I'm actually the opposite way. I feel so much more comfortable with science because um, I've been, uh, I, I, I was in that direction uh, since high school. I, I did uh, all my electives in science, then uh, in college was uh, science and everything until my PhD. And I don't have an artistic uh, education for that matter, but I feel like it has grown in me. And even if um, it, I mean, I'm happy to say I'm an artist, but I feel a little shy to say it compared to when I say I'm a scientist, but I actually want to get to a point where I don't have to choose between one. 
but when I can say, yeah, I'm very good at both. And I think everybody can. So if I will encourage everyone that's watching, if you feel interesting in one or the other, don't try to discard uh, any of them. Just try to uh, work on them and you can be good at both and enjoy uh, without having to choose one of them. I totally agree with that. That's why I finally have decided that I'm a dancing biologist. <laughs> All right, thank you both so much for those answers. I do wanna show um, a, a few more um, bits of our, our student work. So Danny, if you can pull up those. Um, so before we were talking about um, pigments, and so Annabelle said that pigments, um, before we could like make them in a lab or whatever, um, <laughs> They, they would come from nature. And so Annabelle was talking about some maybe stones that would have a lot of colors, but a lot of these colors also come from um, plants. So one of our amazing students, Sophia, took these berries that she found and crushed them up and used a technique called chromatography to separate out the pigments. And so here we can see that it's not, it wasn't just one red color, but there's actually some purple in there, some yellowy and brown colors. So I was really excited about this work because it kind of shows like how we can discover new things in nature. And um, these last couple of slides show some of the work that the students did describing natural samples using something called a sun print or a cyanotype. So the pigments that are in this paper actually change color depending on how much sunlight has hit them, or UV light. And so these are two examples of the students' work here. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, two of our students, Elvin and Olivia, had this really creative idea to take x-rays that they bought of animals and put them on the sun print paper so that the areas that were the most white, where the bones were, actually got the most UV light. So if you can see how those are the darkest here, and they, I think these are so beautiful and really interesting. And this is a really creative way to um, demonstrate their observations. So I just wanted to say, you guys are awesome. Um, and I love this work that you did. Um, Annabelle and, and Frank, what do you think about their cyanotypes? I think they're amazing. I actually love both of them with the leaves. They're so pretty. I love all the cyanotypes. Actually, fun fact, one of the first publications where there was a book, um, I think maybe in the late 1800s, something like that, that was made to characterize all the plants. So I see in them uh, a lot of like uh, also art history. They're beautiful. And the x-rays are just so cool. I love them. It's a great idea. Frank. Yeah, I love, I love the uh, images. I also like the, the, I meant to say, I really love the spore prints. Those are really beautiful images. And it's nice to see um, how passionate those two uh, students were about their spore prints, but these are also very amazing. It, it reminds me of, uh, you know, this ability to see things and looking at things under a microscope, or in this case, being able to use these, um, using the paper and the, and the x-ray technique to, um, or, or to see what's happening inside the body. So again, this idea of revealing and, and information and being able to see things that are not visible with our eyes typically. Um, so it's, it's very beautiful, uh, very beautiful images. I totally agree. Um, thank you again to the, the Sunday scientist who made all of this amazing art and who um, allowed me to share it today. I'm very, very impressed by all of you. Alex, are there any last questions that you have from the chat? No, that was all of our chat questions. We ended with the good one with Ethan's <laughs> question. 
Perfect. Okay. So if there are no other chat questions, I'm actually going to go to our third special guest, who is Senator Jose Serrano. Hi. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of questions for the senator um, that are a little bit about what his job is and a little bit about how um, you are responding in your work to our, the current situation that we're in with the pandemic. So first, my question to you is, can you describe in two minutes or less what you do for a living? So what does a state senator do? Well, thank you first for having me. I'm a big fan of BioBus. This is really a treat for me. Um, a, stead, a state senator is an elected official that is part of a legislative body meaning we are elected to be part of a group of senators from different parts of the state. And we meet in Albany and we vote on everything from the state budget and how that pertains to education and uh, roads and bridges and things of that nature and other individual bills that are designed hopefully to make our lives better, more fair, more just. Um, we represent individual districts. I represent the 29th Senate District, which covers the South and West Bronx. It covers East Harlem and Yorkville, Roosevelt Island, Central Park, the Upper West Side. So it's a geographic area. And um, the work that we do is sort of not limited to voting on bills and passing bills, but also we get the opportunity every day to hear from constituents, constituents are folks who live in our district, um, to hear from them about their concerns. Some of them have very, very personal concerns about their housing, about uh, their health insurance and things of that nature. And some of them have broader questions about, you know, how do we tax and how do we, uh, how do we fund education? And I, and I have the ability with my staff to try to help uh, individual constituents with their problem. Um, so it is very gratifying and it's, and it really is uh, an honor and a, and a privilege to do this work. Um, so I, I, I look at it as uh, being a public servant, meaning that we are here to serve the public. We are elected by the, uh, by the people of our district to be part of a representative democracy. And we are the mouthpiece and the speakers for my constituents. So I have to make sure that I'm in tune and I'm aware of what my constituents want me to fight for. Um, so if I, you know, if folks voted for me based on, um, you know, making sure that our parks are safe and clean and, and nice and green, and then I go to Albany and say, you know, I think we need to build high rises on all the parks. Well, I, I would be derelict in my duty. I would not be doing what I was sent there to do. Um, and in the next election, the voters would probably select someone else and, and put me out, which is, which is their job. So it is a, a, a really good system and I, I appreciate being able to do it. Thank you so much for that answer. And thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Um, my next question is, how are you responding to the impact of COVID-19 in our most vulnerable communities in your district? Well, that's very important because COVID-19 has uh, highlighted um, a lot of the disparities that we already knew existed in our communities. So. Um, as a Latino in my community, I saw for many years that we suffered disproportionately uh, from uh, preventable health issues, health disparities as we call them. Um, and those are long lasting, those are chronic issues that have been there for a long time. And we spoke about them oftentimes in the hypothetical, hoping that we can do better. But when COVID hit, it it had a far more detrimental effect on those who were more um, susceptible health-wise. And I think this ties in very, very neatly with the work that, that you're doing with Biobus and the, and the way that you're, you're sort of explaining 
to, to our students how we relate to the natural world and how we indeed are living organisms amongst other living organisms. And when an organism is, is battling something like diabetes or heart disease, um, if you add on top of that a, a very dangerous virus like coronavirus, the, the organisms that are already suffering from disease are gonna have a much harder time fighting off the coronavirus. So this is why it, it, what we have learned through coronavirus is that we have to be surgical in our approach to rooting out health disparities in our community. And, and I think that's one of the challenges that coronavirus has created amongst many, many others. I would need hours sort of to explain all the different ways that coronavirus has hurt our ability to educate our children, to go see a play or a movie, to go out dancing with friends, to eat in a restaurant, you name it. There are so many limitations that the coronavirus has put upon us. Yeah, thank you. Um, my last question is what message would you have to the students who are watching? Well, I, my message to the students uh, would be to, to be curious, to find different things that spark your curiosity every single day and don't be afraid to ask. Um, when I was a, a student back in the in elementary school back in the 1970s and 80s, I, I was a very shy student. But, but once I found the courage to start asking more questions and uh, develop that intellectual curiosity and uh, it's something that never left me. So even now as an adult, I wanna know how everything works. I wanna know everything about biology. I wanna know everything about mechanics. I wanna know everything about everything. Um, and, and thankfully we have the internet. When I was a kid, we didn't have that. So I had to go and look at some antiquated encyclopedia that was gathering dust on a shelf and ho you know, find something from 1950 that explained you know, radiators. So I was always interested, but that intellectual curiosity, the students that you have, and when they step onto the bio bus, that, that's like being a, a kid in a candy store. And, and don't ever lose that because even when you're done with high school and college and graduate school, you're not done learning. All of those things do is sort of give you a foundation so that you can learn more as you grow older and that you never stop learning and you never stop trying to get better. And I think learning about the biological world around us is one of the most fascinating things you can do. You go on a hike, you go out to the park, you go down the block, you see the biological world all around you. And it's such a beautiful thing to learn about. Thank you so much for saying that. Curiosity is a huge part of science and art too. So that was another similarity. Yes. Oh. Well, yeah. So well, Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, it's funny you mention art because you know what one of the things that has suffered very much under COVID has been the ability to go see a play or or some of the school trips that a lot of students do, and and I I hope that we use this as an opportunity to understand how important those things were now that we're missing them, and that we as a as a government. Uh, never take that for granted again and make sure that we really fortify um, our ability to go be engaged in the arts or biology or you name it. Um, because you don't really miss your water until the, the well runs dry. And now that we don't have all of these things that we, I don't want to say took for granted, but we, we just knew they were there. Now we have to make sure going forward that we explore them, that we embrace them, and that we celebrate them every day. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, that is about all the time we have for today. Thank you, Senator Serrano, for being here and answering our questions. Thank you My to pleasure. everyone who participated in this student town hall and all of the student town halls that we've done this year. And thank you especially to our guest scientists, Annabelle and Frank, for answering our questions. 
Yay. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. It was fun. So um, let me just tell you about a couple more ways that you can keep doing science with BioBus, even though we're taking a break from our live student town halls. Um, Danny, would you be able to pull up the slides for everybody? Oh, those x-rays, amazing. OK. <laughs> um, so we have lots of cool experiments and challenges that everyone can try right now in our Explore at Home section of the BioBus website. So check out biobus.org and click on the Explore at Home tile. Um, and you can also learn a lot more about some interesting topics by watching our past student town halls. And you can find out some new facts to share with your friends and family. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again to the amazing students in our Sunday science class. Um, I appreciate all of your hard work and creativity throughout this fall. Um, so if you want to learn more about our BioBus programs, head to biobus.org. Um, you can check out the link in the description below and follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, using our handle at BioBus to keep discovering with us. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. I'll see you next year. Happy holidays to you all.